the um, so uh, flight is very physiologically demanding. So for example, a bird like this is exercising about eight to 12 times its resting metabolic rate. So it's very intense exercise. And that's equivalent to about two times the maximum aerobic capacity of a similarly sized mammal. So something like a mouse um, can't come close to the type of exercise intensity that migratory birds are capable of. And migration can make up 50% of the annual energy budget for a migratory bird like this. So they invest a lot of energy in migration. And as I said, flight is a very expensive part of that. They also maintain these flights for very long periods of time. So um, I don't know if you're, you might be familiar with this, but the world record nonstop flight for any migratory bird is the Bartail Godwit, which is a uh, trans-Pacific migrating shorebird that can fly for nine days without stopping for food or water. So it's an incredible physiological feat that they're capable of. Typically, uh, a bird like this black throated blue warbler would fly at night for about maybe six, eight, 12 hours before landing when sun came up. But the, the longest that a bird like this is known to fly is about three days uh, nonstop, again, without uh, any food or water on that trip. So they're incredibly, uh, incredible athletes. Now, species like this black throated blue warbler typically don't do that kind of journey in one go. So they would breed, say, in the boreal forest, then they would migrate down back and forth to their wintering grounds in the West Indies by flying at night and stopping during the day to refuel. So they make their trip in a number of hops. And we call these places that they stop at stopover sites. And while they're there, they rest, they refuel um, to get ready for the next flight. But it turns out refueling is also very expensive for migratory birds. They feed at very high rates. We call that hyperphagia. They eat twice as much as they would normally do. And they can actually reach about the maximum rate at which their digestive systems can process food and turn it into fuel which I'll talk about in a second. But most of you, or some of you at least, might be surprised to find out that um, birds actually spend about 70 to 80% of the time and energy of the total migration at stopover sites. So even though flight is very expensive, it's not the most expensive thing of the journey. They actually spend the vast majority of the energy at stopover sites. And while they're there, they have to compete with other individuals like these Western sandpipers. They're packed in, and they can be packed in like this at a stopover site. And they also have to watch out for predators. So spending most of this time and energy at the stopover um, is also important to think about because in terms of conservation, we can't really do much for them while they're in the air. But we can provide good stopover sites for them to refuel. Okay, so one of the coolest things about migratory birds is that they are fat burning machines. They are really good at putting on huge amounts of fat and then using it to fuel these flights. And I hope, um, Julie, can you see my pointer here on the screen? Yes, I can see your pointer, yeah. Oh, excellent. Okay, so what I'm showing here, this is a Swainson's thrush, and this is, if you've been to a bird banding lab, you've probably seen this, where they blow the feathers apart, and you can see this yellow fat that's in the uh, furcular region around the collarbones of the bird, and that's one way they fat score these birds, and you can also just make out the flight muscle. The skin on these birds is so thin and translucent that you can actually see the muscles right through the skin. But anyway, they will put on a huge amount of fat. Sometimes they can reach 50% of body fat. Okay, so you can think of them as morbidly obese super athletes. They have this incredible aerobic capacity, but they also get incredibly fat. And they use that fat for about 90 to 95% of the energy of the flight. And then sort of miraculously compared to humans, when they're not in migratory season, they cure themselves and get skinny again. So they have really fascinating uh, physiological abilities. So fat is the major fuel. 
And it turns out, I don't have time to go into this, but a bunch of my research is focused on how they use that fat as fuel because um, mammals are terrible at using fat as their fuel for running. In fact, um, marathon runners use mostly uh, carbohydrates, and that's why they carbo load before they do these big marathon events. But birds are just unbelievably good at using fat as their fuel. But they don't only use fat to fuel these long flights that they do. And this is some really fascinating data from the garden warbler. It's a Eurasian species that breeds in Europe and it winters south of the Sahara Desert. And what you're seeing here is the size of flight muscles, leg muscles, the gizzard, which is the grinding stomach of the bird, and the small intestine on the left two points before, and then the right two points are after it's crossed the Sahara Desert. And you can see that before it, as it prepares to leave, the flight muscles get a bit bigger, the leg muscles get bigger, the stomach gets bigger because it's fueling, it's eating lots of uh, food, and, uh, and the small intestine is, is fairly large. And after they make this uh, multi-day flight across the desert, they've burned up about 25% of their flight muscle and leg muscle, and even the heart can decrease by 25%. Um, but the gut really gets reduced. So the stomach and the small intestine and the liver can decrease by as much as 50% from their pre-flight weight. So birds break down their organs and muscles during these migratory flights. And I won't go into the physiology behind it, but essentially they can't burn only fat. They need to do things like make new glucose from their protein stores that are in these muscles and organs. So they can really deplete their body condition while they're making these long flights. And in fact, um, even though protein makes up only about uh, five to 10% of the energy of their flights, it can make up about 50% of the weight loss that they incur while they're making this, uh, these nonstop flights. So they arrive at stopovers, they've lost fat, and they've also lost protein. And that's important to think about when we think about stopover because you can only rebuild protein by eating protein, which means they might need to find things like insects to get enough protein to rebuild their guts and their muscles before they can make their next journey. Okay, so refueling sites are really critical for this recovery and rebuilding fuel stores for the next, um, the next flight. So, um, when we think about stopover sites, we have to think about how do we provide high quality habitat that allows for rapid fuel deposition, okay? So that could include foods like fruits or nectar if you're a hummingbird or even seeds that are good for depositing fat quickly. But we also have to think about, um, do those habitats have to have good insect populations to provide the, uh, the right amount of protein to rebuild the lean tissues as well. Okay, so um, in my lab, we do a lot of research on factors that affect refueling rates at stopovers. And we've been particularly interested in habitat fragmentation, urbanization, and the effects of invasive plants and how birds cope with these challenges in these human dominated landscapes. Because face it, um, there are no pristine, large scale pristine areas left for migratory birds to move through. So they're regularly faced with different types of, um, of habitats. So if you look at on the left here, um, imagine you're a bird flying over Southwest Ontario and the sun comes up and you're looking for a place to stop and you're looking down at this landscape and you see all this, if you're a forest bird, you see all this open territory, well, that's no good. You see these different patches of forest. Some are little, some might be hedgerows. Some like this might be a nice riparian area along a river. Well, maybe that's a good place to get um, uh, good foods for, for refueling. And maybe big patches of forest are actually the best. But we don't really know a lot about what makes good stopover ha habitat. Are these little patches just as good as the riparian or, or big areas? 
Um, we've also done some work on urban environments. So this is a satellite view of, of Manhattan, um, New York City. So this is Brooklyn down here. This is Manhattan Island. And birds actually stop in big numbers. You know, if you've ever seen birding in Central Park, there's, there's a lot of birds that pack into these urban parks. And um, you might wonder whether those make good habitat or whether they're ecological traps where um, birds will land but not be able to refuel. Um, we've also looked at invasive plants. So what I'm showing you here is in, in Arizona in the Southwest United States. This is a plant called salt cedar and it tends to take over um, riparian habitats in the Southwest deserts. The key to this, to, to assessing stopover habitat is trying to figure out what is the rate of fuel deposition? Because it's been shown both theoretically and empirically that the rate at which birds can refuel um, affects their overall migration speed and success at getting to their breeding and wintering areas. And unfortunately, it turns out that it's not very easy to measure the refueling rate in different habitats. And this is because if you go out and you, um, you know, if you're just bird watching, you can't tell anything about how fast animals are refueling. You might see them catching prey items and you might be able to measure the amount of insects, but you're not able to tell from that individual bird point of view how good that habitat is. If you put out mist nets, like you'll see at bird banding stations, you may catch birds, but you only catch them once. And it's very, very, um, it's very rare to get that same bird back a few days later and be able to measure it by weighing how much weight it put on or fuel it put on during that intervening period. So we have very little information about refueling rates and how they vary between different types of habitat. So as a physiologist, I took um, a different approach to this. And um, I and others um, put a lot of effort into developing plasma metabolite profiling as a way to determine the feeding or fasting state or the rate of refueling from a single captured bird by looking at the concentrations of key metabolites in its blood. So the ones we focus on are shown here. This is uh, triglycerides and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Triglyceride is, if you've ever gone to have your lipids screened by, for, by your doctor, um, triglyceride is the fat form that goes into your fat stores, into those big, in a bird, you know, those big subcutaneous fat stores that you see are full of triglycerides. And they're produced either from the diet itself coming into the gut or by the liver. So the liver can take in things like sugar from fruit and nectar and convert it into fat. And when it does that, it makes it into triglycerides. So if you're feeding at a very high rate, like if you just had dinner and you've sat down to see my talk now, um, your blood triglycerides are gonna go up. Um, conversely, when you wake up in the morning and haven't eaten for 12 hours, your triglycerides will be low. And it's the same in a bird. On the other hand, beta-hydroxybutyrate is a ketone body that is produced in high amounts when you're fasting. So it's, it offers a nice mirror to what triglycerides are doing. And, and so um, when, you're, when you're feeding, beta-hydroxybutyrate decreases, and when you're fasting, it increases. So we can take a, a, a small blood sample uh, from a bird here. So you can see we've poked it, um, a vein in its wing, and we take a tube of blood and we separate the plasma out of that and we go back to the lab and we measure these metabolites. And we've shown in a variety of validation studies, both in the field and in the laboratory, that the rate at which a bird is putting on weight is correlated to the concentrations of these metabolites in their blood. And what's beautiful about this technique is that it gives us a snapshot of the rate at which the bird is gaining or losing weight at the time we caught it. And it, we've done some studies to show that it really reflects about the last 20 minutes. These change very quickly in birds. So if we catch them, we can get a picture of what it's been doing in the last 20 minutes, which limits it to a fairly small chunk of habitat. Okay, so now, um, 
I'm going to give you an example where we did this that's relevant to London because we live in a we live in a city. And this was some work done by a uh, former PhD student of mine, Chad Seawagon at, at the AFAR at Western. And um, he worked at the Bronx Zoo here in, in, in Bronx Park for a long time. And he wanted to study how migratory birds refueled in the habitat around the Bronx, Bronx Zoo. And you can see that little green speck here. So this is Manhattan. Central Park is here. Okay, we couldn't work in Central Park, too busy, too many people. Um, but we, what we did was we wanted to compare how birds refueled in urban parks versus um, places well outside of New York City. Okay, so we worked in three urban parks. Inwood Park is right up here at the top of Manhattan Island. Bronx Park, again, is around the Bronx Zoo. And Prospect Park is a beautiful and big park in the center of Brooklyn that was actually designed by the same designer who, um, who designed Central Park. Um, so it's very similar in layout to Central Park, but um, we, were, we were able to uh, uh, do the work there. And then we also worked at this Marshlands Conservancy and Pound Ridge, which are um, well outside of the city and in large contiguous forested habitats. And we predicted going in that birds would, would sort of be in an ecological trap in the city, that they would come in, they would, um, um, you know, try to refuel but not put on weight very quickly. And so their refueling rate should be lower there than outside the city. Okay, so the first thing we can see, this is with mist nets, you can see the birds caught per 100 mist net hours in the spring and fall. So that's in the shaded and the open uh, bars in the urban sites here and in the non-urban sites. And the first thing you can see is there's a lot of birds that stop in the city, especially in Prospect Park in the spring. There are tons of songbirds stopping there to refuel. And so you might expect all this competition would lead to lower refueling rates. But in fact, that was not the case at all. So this is um, six different species of songbirds. Um, and this is um, the triglyceride level. So remember, these are high when birds are putting on weight. And we're comparing the urban to the non-urban sites. And you can see that in all the species except one, there was no difference in, in the levels of triglycerides between um, the urban and non-urban sites. And the difference in yellow rump warblers was fairly small anyway. And so this is kind of good news because it says that um, even though there's lots of competitors in those urban parks, the birds that stop there are able to refuel at high rates. So in other words, if you can provide green space, even in urbanized environments, the birds will use it and they'll be able to refuel and continue migrating. We also found some other interesting um, um, relationships that, that tell us that this plasma metabolite method makes sense and works. So here you see triglyceride levels compared between spring and autumn. And as you, as you might expect with birds being in a, in a more of a rush in the spring, they're also refueling more quickly um, than they are in the fall. Okay, so um, now what's missing from this picture is now we can have a way of telling how fast they refuel, but we don't know much about the behavior. So how, do the, how does that habitat quality translate into how long they stay in that habitat or their activities while they're in there? And this is where automated radio telemetry comes in. Um, this is something we've been developing since about 2008 with lots of collaborators. And it's really reached a state of maturity where we can get some really exciting information. So automated digital radio telemetry, this is where we can put small transmitters, as you see here on a bird and a bat. They're very small now, about 300 milligrams. So they can go on the smallest migrants. Um, and what's interesting about them is they're, they all transmit on the same radio frequency, but they're digitally encoded, sort of like your cell phones. So we can detect hundreds and hundreds, up to thousands of tags all at the same time and monitor all those birds at the same time. We, um, we have automated stations that run on solar panels and they have multiple directional antennas. So we can tell which direction birds are coming and going from. 
We can detect birds from about 15 to 20 kilometers away um, in the air and about a kilometer or two on the ground. And so we get high temporal and geographic precision. As you can see, the tags are very small. And when we started out with this around Long Point, we started out with about five uh, radio station uh, receiver stations, and we could see that it would work. But um, through a grant from the Canada Foundation for Innovation, a bunch of collaborators and I um, started what's called the MODIS Wildlife Tracking System, which is now run by Birds Canada. And um, it's a cooperative system where researchers like me and other groups, conservation organizations can set up their own towers, maintain them, and tag birds and bats. Um, and since they're all on the same frequency, wherever my animal goes, if it's detected on someone else's tower, I will get that data and vice versa. And it's now grown into over a thousand of these towers in 31 countries around the world with about 900 different research groups and at least 25,000 tags have been deployed. So we have this massive way to, of ground-based telemetry to track uh, birds. Okay, in Southwest Ontario, we actually have a quite good coverage of these towers. So you can see, especially around Long Point, um, and even in our region, we can get a good idea of the comings and goings of, of migratory birds, bats, and even insects now. So if you're interested in MODIS, um, you can go to modis.org and find out lots of information about how it works and what kind of research people are doing with it. Okay, so I want to show you what we can do with this. This is some data from black-throated blue warblers shown here. You can see it's got a little tag on its back. And this is a record of its stopover near Long Point. Um, and this data is from Yolanda Morby, a colleague of mine at, uh, at Western, who I work closely with. Um, and you can see what, what I'm showing you here are um, 13 days of stopover for this individual black throated blue warbler. Um, the different colors are the, the radio signals from three different antennas, one, two, and three, on one tower at Long Point. And what you can see is during the day, it's very active, and so the signal strength is bouncing up and down. And then when it goes to sleep, it becomes very steady. Um, and then the next morning, it wakes up, and it's active, and then it sleeps and active. OK, so we get a really good act record of its activity um, when it goes to sleep, when it wakes up, um, and eventually on the final day when it actually departs and continues on its next migratory flight, which is um, really amazing to be able to see. And I'll show you that in a second. And we learn lots of information about activity at stopover <clears throat> from the MODIS data. So one thing we learn is about the daily or the diurnal timing of waking up and going to sleep relative to sunrise and sunset. And so here's some interesting data from three species of warblers, black-throated blue, magnolia, and myrtle warbler in black, blue, and green. And what you can see, this is the distribution of when they wake up relative to sunrise. So it's about 20, 30 minutes before sunrise for each species. And what you can see is black-throated blue warblers wake up significantly earlier than magnolia warblers and myrtle warblers. So myrtle warblers are kind of the lazy ones. Um, and they, the myrtles actually go to sleep earlier. So this is when they go to sleep at the end of the day, and you, we see the same kind of progression. So we get information like that. This, um, we, Yolanda did a study and showed that um, birds actually change their, their sleep behavior on the day that they're going to depart. So they actually stay, some of them, like this magnolia warbler and black-throated blue warbler, they stay up a bit later. This is the distribution of when they stop being active. They stay up later um, by about 10 or 15 minutes on the, um, the day that they know they're gonna leave. So it, maybe they're working harder to get fueled up to go. Um, on the other hand, white-throated sparrows actually go to bed a little earlier on the night that they're gonna depart. And what I mean by that is they stop being active um, and then a few hours later, they wake up and start their nightly flight. So we get cool information like that. We also can measure the stopover duration because we know the last day that they were there. And again, we see species differences. So yellow rump warblers stay about on average two days, uh, five days for the black-throated blue, and three and a half days for a magnolia warbler. So now we can put together refueling rates with behavior at stopover. 
Now, in terms of a departure, this is, uh, this is the a blow up of that last day of data for this black-throated blue warbler. And you can see, here's the afternoon, it's, it's busy. The signal strength from the radio is bouncing all around. And then it sort of settles down for about an hour or two, right around, this is 9 p.m. right here. So say around, um, this is 8 p.m., a little after nine. And then it wakes up and you see this peak in the signal strength and then a, a decay because as the bird's flying away from long point, its, um, its signal strength drops off dramatically. So we know that's when the bird decided to leave. And then down here, these are other towers further north from long point. And you can see as it passes other towers, the signal strength goes up and then back down. It goes up and back down, up and back down. And so we can tell from that peak when it passed that next tower. Okay, so now if we put all that together, we can reconstruct its migratory path. And we can do things like estimate its flight speed and its flight orientation and whether it's getting wind assistance or not. So all kinds of migratory flight behavior can also come from this automated telemetry. Okay, so here's three examples of, um, um, of uh, some species we've looked at in spring migration leaving long point. So here's black-throated blue warbler again, magnolia warbler, and myrtle warbler. And these are actual tracks of individual birds. You can see some go up to the Bruce Peninsula, some head over by Georgian Bay. Um, and from that, we can measure their migration speed, their direction, and we can even um, try to determine if they've made subsequent stopovers um, before they keep going. So um, now that's just our region, but as I said, MODIS has thousands of towers now uh, all over the US and other places. And so um, MODIS can also be used on a much larger scale. And this study in thrushes in Colombia showed that the fatter these thrushes were um, when they left Colombia in the springtime to head north, the more quickly they made it back to the United States and Canada. And this kind of data has never been available before for such small birds. I mean, with satellite tags, we could track large birds, but to be able to know the day um, a bird that was wintering in Colombia left, what its body condition was, and then how quickly it arrived back in the US and Canada is just a phenomenal achievement. Okay, so this data here on, on the right-hand side shows birds with um, um, low fuel stores versus high fuel stores. And the fatter they were, the more quickly they made the trip from Colombia to the United States and Canada. Okay, so I want to, um, I want to turn uh, quickly here towards the end to uh, what we're learning about um, migratory uh, bats. So in North America, there are three, unlike birds where there's hundreds and hundreds of migratory species, there's three really long distance migrant um, bats. And we call them tree bats because they don't spend the winter uh, roosting together in caves. They like to be more solitary and roost in, in trees um, and other structures. So this is the hoary bat, this is the Eastern red bat, and this is the silver haired bat. So those are the three um, species. And we've been trying to do some research on those. You can see this red bat also with a modus tag. Um, on its back. And um, uh, I can thank um, Brock Fenton at Western who um, takes all these wonderful uh, photos of birds and bats for us. Okay, so when we, um, the thing about migratory bats is almost nothing is known about them. People don't study them. They rarely get caught. They're solitary. So you don't find them in big concentrations. We know they migrate mostly from museum records and other observations, but we really knew nothing about stopover. And when I arrived at Western now uh, 17 years ago, um, we really didn't even have a spot where we could study them. And then Brock Fenton actually, and some of his students discovered that Long Point is a stopover for migratory bats during very discrete periods in the spring and fall. And so we started to do some research on them again with MODIS and other, and other methods. So um, 
Now, what I want to show you, this is a distribution of stopover durations of black-throated blue warblers from 83 birds that were measured in the fall. And you can see that the average bird stays about four days. Some leave quickly, some stay much longer. And when we started putting radio tags on silver-haired bats, we thought, well, these guys are really going to probably stay a long time because they can only feed or fly at night. And so they're going to have to, you know, refuel for more days because unlike birds that can, you know, feed during the day and then fly at night, the bats are going to be more constrained. But what we found was that the bats don't stay long at all. Silver haired bats, most of them, if you catch them near dawn in the morning, you put a radio tag on them, they roost all day. And when the sun goes down, they just pick up and leave. They may do a bit of feeding. Um, briefly before they take off, but they don't stay multiple days. And um, in this study, the ones that stayed longer, uh, like this, you know, stayed to the next day, was because it rained that night, and they really don't like. Oops, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Um, just reminding me to wrap it up here. So. Um, Anyway, what we discovered was they really don't spend much time at all. And these cases where they stayed longer were because, uh, generally because it rained. And so we asked, why don't the bats stay longer? And we started doing some studies where we put radio tags on them that could actually measure their body temperature. Because what's different about birds, uh, about bats from birds, is that bats are really good at going into torpor and hibernating. So when they're under energy stress, they can drop their body temperature down to near ambient temperature and save lots and lots of energy. And so we discovered that's exactly what they, they do. And we coined this torpor assisted migration. So unlike birds, bats come in and um, if it's, if it's uh, they become inactive during the day. And if it's cool enough, they just drop their body temperature and save on all that thermoregulatory cost that birds typically have to do. So what you're seeing here is the body temperature, the skin body temperature of um, silver haired bat on a day here where it was 27 degrees. And this is a euthermic uh, high body temperature for the bat. And you can see this bat pretty much stayed at a normal body temperature through the day on a warm day. On 22 degree day, it dropped down into torpor for a bunch of the day. And then on a colder day, it went down into torpor and it stayed there for a long period of time. So basically they adjust the amount of torpor they use to, um, to save energy so that they don't need to refuel the way birds do. Okay, and in fact, if you, if you get lots of data on, on these silver haired bats, um, you find that they, they, they live on a nice budget. Their energy savings are realized by increasing the amount of torpor they use on colder days. And so what you see here is the ambient temperature for different days uh, for different bats plotted against the time they spent in torpor. So on a very cool day, like today, it wasn't very warm. I think it got up to 10. Basically, a bat will spend all day down in torpor. Okay, and on warm days, it'll spend much less time in torpor. And this is the relative energy savings that they accrue by staying down in torpor. And so on cold days like this, you don't have to worry about them because they're saving about 90% of the energy they would have spent if they tried to stay warm. So bats are, migratory bats are pretty good at managing their budget of energy to, um, to migrate. The other thing we've been able to do for the first time with migratory, um, with migratory bats was to track their long distance movements, which never has been done before. And so you can see here, um, bats that were marked at long point make long distance flights, go up through the Bruce Peninsula. And, and similarly in the fall, if we mark them up here, they come down through our region. So they really are making these long distance flights just like, uh, just like migratory birds do. Okay, so I want to wrap it up there um, and just say that, you know, London is the forest city. It's got lots of great stopover sites, and I hope you're getting out to see them, uh, seabirds refueling and, um, and getting ready for their next flights. And we need to provide good stopover habitats for uh, these migratory birds as they, um, as they come through, and we need to mitigate threats 
like cats and window collisions to the best of our ability, especially during these migration seasons. The other thing is um, London and the surrounding area, because we have such a good coverage of MODIS um, and the university here, offers a really good opportunity to do um, work on stopover in urbanized and, and rural environments. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, the organizations that fund and support uh, my research and those of us at Western. So NSERC uh, Discovery Grants, our federal, federal government grants, the Canada Foundation for Innovation has built a lot of the infrastructure, including MODIS. And, um, and we also get lots of support from Western. And I'll end it with that and thank you for your uh, attention and um, my collaborators and students for uh, all of their help. Wow, thank you so much, Chris. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I just loved seeing all that MODIS data. I learned so much. Um, uh, yes, it was just truly fascinating. So thank you so much for your talk. Um, I will now open it up to questions. It looks like Cheryl has raised a hand. Did you wanna turn your microphone on to ask your question, Cheryl? I'm not sure if that's a feature in webinar actually, but <laughs> I don't know if you're able to, but if you're not, you can definitely type your question into the chat. Does anybody else have any uh, questions or comments for Chris? Can I see the chat actually myself here? I would have you liked to, to. I would. I would have liked <laughs> to uh, to see myself when uh, when my alarm went off. That was pretty exciting. <laughs> It was exciting. <laughs> yeah, I, was I usually don't. I've never set my timer before while I'm giving a talk, so. <laughs> I didn't I didn't remember that the alarm's actually going to go off. I was just looking at the number. <laughs> no problem. It was it was wonderful. It's like, ah, I'm sure what I, happened? <laughs> probably woke sure up half, on... half the audience too. <laughs> no, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone that it was really interesting data. I'm wondering actually, was there anything specific that surprised you when you were first analyzing that modus data? You know, anything that maybe went against something that was already believed about stopover patterns or migratory data? Um, well, you know, for, for one thing we've learned, um, I'll just give you the example of, of uh, myrtle warblers, yellow rump warblers, mm -hmm. where um, we do a lot of research on them in, in with MODIS and other, and other techniques. And, um, some of the bird um, people down at, at Long Point um, said to us, like Stu McKenzie here that I, I acknowledge, you know, he said, oh, they're weird. They, they, they'll migrate during the day. And we we're like, no, 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 the songbirds, you know, they fuel during the day and then they go to sleep and then mm -hmm. they, they wake up an hour or two after sunset and then they're going to migrate at night. And um, we've seen with, with Modus that you know, black-throated blue warblers, yeah, that and white-throated sparrows, they really migrate at night, and we don't see them leaving during the day. But white, but um, myrtle warblers, very often just take off and leave from Long Point mm. at like 11 a.m. Wow. We'll put radios on them. They'll stay for very short periods of time, and we we think they are just sort of a partial, like a diurnal, nocturnal migrant, where they'll do both. Mm. Um, so yeah, we there's there's often surprises um, with modus. Um, people have discovered that you know, like swallow bank swallow parents leave the leave the chicks at night and go over and roost in the marshes and then come back in the morning. Oh, um, that's also interesting. Yeah. Yeah, like all <laughs> kinds of really interesting movement behavior. Um, mm -hmm. The stuff about when they go to sleep and when they wake up is really fascinating. Um, oh, I found that as part really interesting. Yes. Yeah, because it's individually repeatable. You know, some individuals mm -hmm. wake up early, some go to sleep early, um, and then this thing that that Dr. Morby discovered that they they change that behavior. It what what it it showed for the first time is that a bird kind of knows in the afternoon that it's going to migrate that night and then still goes to sleep and wakes up and then leaves. 
right? Just like if we were going on vacation and we might, yeah. uh, you know, you have a flight at midnight and you know, and you plan ahead. And yeah, yeah so there's like so this planning ahead. And, and mm -hmm. that means hormonal changes. That means, you know, metabolic changes are probably happening um, rather than what the, the model we thought it was, which is that they would, they would wake up and assess the situation. Like, are the winds good? They're really, you know, um, I'll come back to that, but you know, is it a good night to go? And then they, um, and then they make the decision, but it looks like they're making the decision earlier. And we know those decisions are also, there's a very strong effect of, of winds, which, you know, we know birds use wind assistance, but we can see it in the MODIS data that they're very selective of the, of the wind condition. That's one of the most important factors that determines when they leave. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of cool things you can pull out of that, that MODIS data. So fascinating. Um, okay, I see a few questions have uh, come into the chat and I apologize for the lawnmower sound. <laughs> Hopefully it's not too loud in my, uh, uh, in my yard. Um, where is, Doug wonders, where is the best place around the London area for viewing migratory birds? Well, that's, that's a good question. You know, believe it or not, I, I mean, I am a birder, but I am not the best birder. I live my life like working with birds. So, but I, um, because of the pandemic last spring, we started going out a lot more to local areas, right? And um, I just go down to Kalali Meadows. And if you're there on a good day, it's like, why are we driving all the way down to Long Point to go see these birds? I mean, the, there's just warblers everywhere. So um, we like to go to That's Kamoka. one of my favorite spots. <laughs> yeah, yes, Kalali. Kalali. Uh, yep. uh, along Get the Kalali. river is good. Um, but Kalali, um, um, we go to Kamoka. It's a great place. Meadow yeah. Lily. Um, I yeah. should say Westminster Ponds, Pond Mills. Uh, I, I would have Julie chime in here because she's a heavy duty bird. I agree with all those places. I think, um, well, going back to that uh, data you were also showing about how, um, you know, how, uh, how many migratory birds are using urban spaces to refuel for their stopovers. Yes, like Kaleli is one of my personal favorites. Last spring, I had an experience where I was there on a day where the trees were dripping with warblers, as they say, when there's just so many warblers and they're nice and low there because they like the That's shrubby right. bits on the path alongside the path. Uh, Westminster Ponds is another favorite of mine. Um, and Kamoka. I love Kamoka Park as yeah. well. So you named some of my favorites. Yeah, I mean, at Kalali. Um, we don't have to go too far. Yeah. At Kalali, you know, we were like, you know, you're like eye level practically with perulas, exactly. which would normally way up in the canopy. So yes. it was just, it's just fantastic there. Yes, I Let's agree. Let's get to it's some more questions here. Um, so do birds also need to sleep during the day when they stop over? Mm -hmm. um, sorry, this is from Gail. Uh, mm -hmm. She saw a wren sleep at my bird bath for most of the day. You know, they can um, if they if they're really tuckered out. They can, and especially these long migrants, like, um, you know, like I've said, these shorebirds that fly for days, like a week without stopping, they often, they'll arrive and drink first and then go to sleep. Um, so yeah, sleep is very important. Birds um, actually have been shown to have a, an, a one, an ability to do what's called unihemispheric sleep, where they can sort of let one half of the brain sleep and then it wakes up and the other half um, goes to sleep. Um, and we think they might even sleep while they're flying because um, you know nine days without doing any sleep um, seems pretty impossible. So, um, and there's also, um, it's been shown that Swifts, uh, uh, European Swifts stay on the wing for like 200 days without coming down. And they only come down to nest. And um, so most of the year they're just in the air and, and it looks like in their radio tracks, they go up to a few thousand meters and then do these long, slow glides where they sleep on the wing. So you, it's been seen that um, even during the day, birds, you'll see one eye close and the other eyes open. And that seems to indicate the unis, uni hemispheric sleep. That's so fascinating. I've heard a bit about it before, but I would love to, yes, learn more and, um, Yes, so such an interesting ability to be able to have to do that, to harness that. Um, Amelie says, hi, Chris. 
Torpor assisted migration, how fascinating. Any idea how costly arousal from torpor is? If it was mm -hmm. a really cold day compared to a less cold day, for example, mm -hmm. or, is it that a, or is it that a small price to pay for the energy saved over torpor compared to staying warm? The, the, the arousal is the most expensive thing um, to, uh, to do. Um, so when they come out of torpor, they, they're burning a lot of energy to do that. But the calculations we made there included a, um, a cost of uh, rewarming yourself for the bats. So when mm. I showed that data, I, I'll zip back up here. Um, this data of the energy saved included the, the arousal that, the, that they went through. And so on a cold day, they're still able to save about 90% of their energy that they would have spent if they tried to stay at, at 37 or 40 degrees Celsius all day long. Right. Yep. Okay, great. Good question. Um, so in the Q&A, Brendan says, I see lots of migration map pictures online, but mostly showing only the United States. <laughs> Will Canada ever catch up to the U.S. in terms of being able to track bird migration in real time using satellite imagery? I was just wondering the very same thing myself yeah. this morning, Brendan. <laughs> well, um, the um, we're we're actually starting to put together a grant that I hope we'll, we'll get together and, and, and be successful with to expand MODIS across Canada. So there's a lot of gaps. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd like to get hundreds and hundreds of more towers across uh, across the country. They'll probably still be at low latitudes, though. And so getting mm -hmm. up to those really remote, high latitude places is tough. Um, mm -hmm. The problem is that small migrants are too small for uh, satellite tags, at least what we have now. And um, right. I'll just, uh, this is kind of fortuitous, but... <laughs> I think Chris is grabbing something to show us. <laughs> That's my prediction. <laughs> you guys get the, spe the special show tonight. So <laughs> what I can say is that the technology is coming. There's a new program uh, that just is turned on successfully at the International Space Station called Icarus. It's a receiver on the space station at low altitude, and it's designed to detect small tags on small migrants. And I just received on Friday my first Icarus tag. So wow. this, is a, this is a four gram satellite tag. It records altitude, temperature, um, magnetic orientation, activity level, and GPS position. And it's solar, solar powered and will last the life of the, of the bird. We can put that on. And wow. um, now this tag is, is about four grams. That still can go on about a hundred gram bird, mm -hmm. um, but they are aiming for a one gram tag and right. it, within the next, uh, and, and, and so, and other satellites in low orbit. So, um, you know, it's coming. I would say within a decade, we're gonna be, tracking things like sparrows and such that can carry a, a one gram tag. And once we have that, um, then yes, we will get, we will be able to get tracks um, of our birds moving up into places like the boreal forest. Fantastic. Um, Rob is wondering, do the birds fly together or do they go individually? That's a great question. Yeah, now that just depends on the species. So things like, um, Sorry, that was my, yeah, I'll just leave that. Um, you know, things like waterfowl and shorebirds will fly in flocks. Most mm -hmm. of these nocturnal migrants fly um, on their own. Mm -hmm. So they make their own departure decisions and they fly on their own. And that includes juvenile birds making their first migration. Their parents don't lead them from the breeding areas to the wintering areas. Mm. It's all innate for songbirds. Um, but that said, they do, um, they do make these flight calls while they're flying. And it's thought that, so there are special notes that they sing while they're flying along mm -hmm. and they're species specific. And it's thought that they may play sort of a social organizing role that where birds are, 
you know, flying, or maybe they're on the ground and they hear their species going over and then they take off because, well, if they're flying, it must be a good night to migrate. And mm -hmm. um, so there may be some social organization going on in the, in the atmosphere, but we don't know much about it. We know nothing about it really. Hmm, how interesting. And then often when I'm birding this time of year early in the morning and I find what I call a pocket of warblers, well, what a lot of birders call a pocket of warblers with mixed warbler species, I guess that has more to do with sharing the same food sources. Like they're, they're together because they, they're looking at for the same resources probably. Well, yeah, but there's also um, like chickadee flocks becoming gregarious in the winter to avoid predators. Um, right. Of in course. these species of neotropical migrants, if you go down to the wintering areas in the in the tropics, you'll see mixed species foraging. Oh, flocks. OK. So like they are resident birds. do. That's, yeah. yeah. And so they hang out together on the wintering areas and will go around together. And even with um, some of the non migrant species that also live down there. And so they, mm -hmm. they that increases the vigilance. Mm -hmm. um, of course. Yeah. So, okay, um, yeah there's some social stuff going on. I look forward to hear or finding out more about that once we know more too. Um, so David says, is there any indication of any birds that might go into short-term torpor during migration? Yeah, that's a really good, good question. Um, torpor, certainly hummingbirds. Um, mm. Hummingbirds are known for going into deep torpor, just like bats. And, and they do it as an emergency um, in the, in the, we just did a study on this actually at the AFAR um, with some collaborators from uh, University of Toronto, Scarborough, uh, Ken Welch and Eric Ebert, Eberts. Um, and we looked at ruby-throated th ruby ruby hummingbirds. And what, what they found was that in the summertime, they will go into torpor at night if they have low energy stores. So if, mm -hmm. they, if they're running out of fuel, they just go down into torpor. But in the late summer, they totally turn off that, that physiological regulation system and they will go into torpor even if they're fat. Mm -hmm. And so what that allows them to do is they put on fat during the day and then they drop down into torpor even though they don't need to and they save that fat. And that allows them to, to fuel up very quickly. So hummingbirds mm. are definitely do that, um, but it's still, um, there's some evidence in barnacle geese that uh, they're, so they're big bodied, that they actually drop their body temperature a few de degrees for the entire migration season for a similar reason. But we don't know much about mm -hmm. the rest of the songbirds. And so Liam McGuire actually at Waterloo, who's now a professor at Waterloo, is, is doing studies. He did the bats on the budget. PhD with me. But anyway, now he's, um, he's interested in looking at songbirds and whether they go down into not really torpor, but they can do a hypothermia and drop their temperature a few mm -hmm. degrees. There's also some evidence from uh, black caps that are a European species, where they were showed to drop their temperature during the migration, but it looked like only when they were very thin. So not like the, mm. you know, sort of like an emergency stage, they would drop out their, of necessity, mm -hmm. out of necessity. But so far, there's not strong evidence that that um, that they do it the way the way that the bats do. And, and so what happens on a cold night, if the bird isn't migrating, it actually loses a lot of the fuel that it put on during the day. And that's why stopover right. is so expensive. That's why 70 or 80 percent of the energy of, of the whole migration is in stopover. A lot of it is thermoregulation. Mm -hmm. Wow. Great, great mm -hmm. question. I have one last question here uh, from Margaret. Um, she asks, are you able to determine which, or, sorry, whether the ESAs are utilized by the birds? So I guess which environmentally significant areas here in London, is it kind of that specific uh, that you're able to tell from the tower data or MODIS? Oh, no, not, unfortunately not from MODIS. We don't get that kind of spatial resolution. Um, the way that would be done was would would probably have to be with um, with manual telemetry tracking individuals down. We get more broad scale information from MODIS, um, except in very specific setups where we can put lots of little receivers in a small area and we can get tighter mm -hmm. spatial resolution. But to tell you the truth, I don't know 
um, about how what a role the ESAs are playing compared to other properties. Um, mm -hmm. So that would be done through bird surveys, and certainly could be something that you know the city could could be doing to um, to figure out. The only thing I would say is that um, you know the better you the better habitat you can provide. The, the better it is for the birds. But, you know, we do see these species in your backyards, in small parks. Um, and so, you know, we should be trying to provide good conditions for them wherever we can. Yes. And Margaret spe specified the coves ESA. And I used to live right near the coves and I definitely saw tons of migratory birds uh, using that space as a stopover in the spring. So, um, Yes, like you just said, Chris, all of these spaces are so important to birds, um, especially this time of year. Uh, so that looks like all of our questions for tonight, but uh, thank you again so much, Chris. What fascinating information. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time to share this data with us and share your uh, knowledge with us. Um, thank you all again for attending. Thank you to our London Bird Team partners. Um, we'll also be record, uh, posting the recordings of this uh, uh, talk as well as Andrea Boyer's talk on Wednesday to our website on the Bird Friendly uh, City, or sorry, birdfriendlylondon.ca website. So please feel free to check those recordings out later. Um, and lastly, we will we are also we have a vote open right now for London's official city bird, and we'd love for you to participate. So I'll just post the link to that in the chat now. Um, oh, accidentally just posted it only to panelists. Let me post it to the attendees. Oh, one moment. <laughs> Sorry, I just want to get you that link for London city bird. There we go. So you can go to birdfriendlylondon.ca and cast your vote for London's official city bird. Uh, we would love if you participated in that and just spread the knowledge that London is now officially certified as a bird friendly city. Um, but that's it for tonight. Thanks again, Chris. Thank you everybody and happy birding this spring. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.